Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Hope you're all having a, uh, hope you had a great new year, hope you had a great holiday. Uh, I recorded a lot of stuff on the holiday. Now we're back, starting fresh with some new recorded stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I got a new sweater. We're all do good. We're all, it's all good, all good. And we, uh, what a way to get back in new recordings and, of course, continuing the series of disturbing things. From around the internet, we got volume ten. Volume ten of it. Got three more, and then we're out for this series until they re, until they do some more. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's ready. We get started on this. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. There's a certain beauty that exists in works of media that can both scare and engage you. The many nights that I've spent awake, lights off, blanket on, soaking up content from the darker side of the world that we all live in has blessed me with both memories and scars that will live with me for a lifetime. I love to be scared, and given the fact that you're here tonight, it's safe to assume that you do too. I started this series back in 2018 because there were a few creepy oddities that I found back at that point in time. But, little did naive me know that if you do a bit of digging, you'll unearth a bit more than you were ever prepared for. Tonight, I aim to celebrate the 10th episode of this series with some of the most bone-chilling discoveries that I've come across to date. I mean that, if you're here for a casual viewing experience, I suggest you leave now. It's time to get into five more handpicked, and disturbing things from around the internet. Alright, I'm ready. Hit me. Oh god, this whole setup and the rain noise and that, oh, it's giving me such a creepy vibe, oh my god. That, well done, that gives you a creepy vibe from the beginning. The popularity of doorbell cameras has been on the rise since the mid-2010s, being utilized as tools that can monitor your home when you're away. Residents that own them have caught some incredibly bizarre footage. While a disturbing masked figure, a TV man, and a girl stumbling onto someone's porch are some of the most notable bits of video out there, they pale in comparison to how unnerving the following footage is. On the night of November 12th, 2019, at 11.11 p.m., a family in Los Angeles heard screaming that sounded like a kidnapping or a murder was taking place. After the initial shock of hearing it, they went out to their porch in hopes of witnessing what was unfolding. That's, oh, that's weird, because, okay, so the screams are clear terror. This person is screaming in terror. The person is clearly distressed and probably does not want to be around the people she's with, if there's, even if it ain't a kidnapping. So she's clearly scared and does not want to be around these people. The part that's just 
catching me off guard is you hear the person saying sorry to anyone who's hearing her scream. I don't think a kidnapper would do that because a kidnapper would not want her screaming to be heard. And I think that's what makes me not be able to kidnap it because the screams are very... A person you kidnap usually doesn't make the screams available for the person. A person doesn't put a person in a car and start screaming. It allows them to scream. So, I feel that this might be either somewhat a family situation. It's either that, or even though it's not as bad thing, it might be a boyfriend related to, like, a, like a boyfriend who grabbed the person, brought him back, and, like, who's, like, abusive and that. That might be the case. I... <sighs> I could be wrong, but I don't think this has been solved from what I remember about this. So I feel that that's what happened. Shortly after this incident, the police were called out to location to investigate. They questioned residents and inquired with the surrounding homes on if they too had a doorbell camera. However, not much came of it aside from a few eyewitness accounts. Those that were able to catch a glimpse of the chaos claimed that the vehicle in question was an unknown white hatchback. Apparently, while the woman was screaming for help, a man in the driver's seat was apologizing nonstop before the vehicle sped off out of earshot. As of writing, this investigation is ongoing. Surprisingly, updates have been sparse, leaving various onlookers frustrated at the lack of a resolution. The woman's screams were bone chilling. And unfortunately, without a conclusive lead so far, we're merely left to keep an ear out, hoping that she made it out of that situation unharmed. If there was an update on this and people know, let me know in the comments, because I don't think there is, but those screams are terrifying. Again, I don't think it's a kidnapping against the will, like, I don't think it's kidnapping or with plans to, like, kill or something like that, but that is, that is scary as hell. She clearly does not want to be around these people. If I'm also correct, the husband from this place, from that dope house, went looking for that blue, that, uh, white car too, but it did not help. It, uh, it could not be found. On June 26, 2019, a Redditor named Bleachpong would make a post that would quickly shoot to the top of the r slash paranormal subreddit. It bears the title. After years of hearing weird noises in our house, we captured something eerie on video. Here, they go forth to explain a bit of backstory about some strange happenings that have played out in their home while accompanying this entire post with an extremely eerie video. In that backstory, they explain the following. First of all, I've never believed in ghosts, and I don't consider my home to be a creepy place at all. The house was only built about nine years ago, and as far as I know, the land it's on doesn't have a dark history of any kind. However, ever since we moved in, we've experienced some strange things. The weirdest part is most of what we've experienced involves toys. Aside from one time, my brother says he clearly heard our dad calling his name from downstairs, only to find out he was the only one home. One recurring thing we've heard tons of times over the years is the sound of someone digging around in this big plastic tub of Lego pieces. When we were kids, we all collected and built bionicles all the time in our playroom upstairs. The sound of shifting the pieces around to look for a part makes a very loud and distinct noise that everyone in our house became familiar with but it was common for us to hear it when we were certain that no one was up there. When we got older, we stored our vast collection of bionicles and tub of loose parts in a long closet, and we've continued to hear the noise coming from there every now and then. We've always been confused and weirded out by the sound, but we never bothered to record the noises just because everyone in our house has heard it firsthand, and a recording of the sound of Legos in the next room didn't seem like it would interest anyone else. 
We told a friend about this, who thought it was crazy, and insisted that we record it next time. Not long after that, both of my brothers were watching TV and heard the sound down the hall. They immediately started recording, and we got pretty decent audio of the noise. I want to reiterate that we've never felt unsafe in our home. We're not bothered by the things we've experienced, but they're a little strange. Let me know what you think. First time I never actually had, I didn't actually read it, even though the guy was going to too. I have learned from my mistakes. <laughs> let's, but let's see what this video has in store. The video attached is about a minute and a half long and shows the three guys pausing their baseball game because they've just heard something out of the ordinary. That is clearly someone going through Legos. I clearly can hear that. That is very clear. There's literally nothing in here. And look how heavy this is. Yeah. Hang on, there's nothing up here. No, I did not. What what uh, what I miss? Oh no. Oh no. Oh hell no. Nip nip. Oh hell to the no. I will. Oh no. <laughs> oh god, man. I don't want to see that moving anywhere. Oh, oh I'll be one. Oh no. I don't like that at all. I don't want no toy of mine moving. That scared the shit out of me. I don't want that. I don't want that at all. As we can see in that footage, the upper torso of that large action figure moved just like that door doll in the previous Disturbing Things episode. People have gone forth to claim that it could either be a battery powered figure or that a mouse might have bumped it, but Bleach Pong denied these both, accompanying their explanation with the full photo of how it was built. Furthermore, they claim that if it were a mouse, then if anything, they'd merely move a few pieces around and not its entire torso. Seeing as the figure is considerably taller than an already tall cereal box, then it would take a substantial amount of force to rotate it, especially given the fact that there isn't exactly a hinge anywhere near its stomach. The only explanation I can really entertain here would be a hoax. However, that would take an extremely small and well-hidden person to sit back there, completely invisible by the camera. Also, the subtlety of the shots, which happens in just a mere split second, lends credence to the fact that the video that they caught was what they presumed to be real, without any sort of foul play. Since this incident. That is true. They don't, because usually if it would be a fake, you would, they would have a bunch, like, full on thing. They'd want you to clearly see it. They'd want you to fully notice it. So yeah, they would have a way thing so they can react and everything to it. This one, they just wanted to record the Legos moving and it just happened they recorded the, the torso of that thing moving. So yeah, I can buy the fact that this probably is a real actual footage. Bleach Pong is vanished. Gone. No updates, which leaves the mystery surrounding this footage stuck in limbo. I truly hope that sometime in the near future, they make a return with pictures, footage, or anything, so we can dig into this mystery a bit deeper. 
he probably has not updated because he's not scared by it. Again, they don't feel unsafe in that house. They've just been with... They said it. They feel fine in the house. They just recorded it because they thought it was weird. So they recorded and posted it. Because here, because people... He thought it was weird still. But yeah, they probably aren't updating because they probably don't really care. And are probably fine with the... Because they don't feel unsafe. For all we know, it could be something mundane or innocent. But given the aforementioned circumstances... It's hard to discount the possibility that Bleach Pong just might have witnessed a haunting. next involves a man by the name of Tim Birmingham. For the past few years now, he's been vlogging his life on his self-titled YouTube channel, and if you watch a bit of his content, you'll notice pretty quickly that Tim is an extremely likable guy. He's a big foodie, he loves the Detroit Lions, and ultimately seems to carry a pretty easygoing life. Unfortunately, in the midst of his uploads, there's one that starkly stands out as one of the most unintentionally unsettling ones on his channel. In an upload titled, She's Still Sleeping, we're able to observe one of his daily vlogs. Before I explain the backstory, have a look at it. Sleeping. <laughs> and she's still sleeping at about past twelve o'clock in the afternoon, everyone. <laughs> that is a rarity for Penny to do is sleep in. <laughs> but yeah, she's sleeping away. Wow, can't believe it. Can't believe it. Oh, please tell me nothing bad has happened to this woman while she was laying there and he's recording her. Oh, please don't tell me this. Oh, this is... Please tell me this man has not done anything to this woman and then recorded her acting like she was sleeping. Amazing, she's just sleeping in. <laughs> Not used to seeing her sleep in. Usually she's up and being on her computer or doing something, but uh, she must be tired. In the video, Tim cheerfully explains that his wife is sleeping in abnormally late and that she's usually up by this point playing on the computer. It's past noon now, and while it's not out of the ordinary for people to sleep past this, little does he know during filming that she isn't sleeping. Penny Bice, Tim's significant other, passed away that night in her sleep due to unknown circumstances. In a follow-up video to this one, he explains that she was up the night before, playing on her computer, and went to bed as usual. The two apparently fight over the blanket pretty often, and he recalls her doing that that night, all with no real indication that anything was vitally wrong. Also in this, Tim addresses some of the comments that people left, heavily criticizing him for keeping the video up. He claimed that he wanted to leave it be so he could have something to remember her by, and seeing as this was over two years ago now, it seems that he held true to his word. Now, okay, let's, let's dissect. So, okay, so this woman... Okay, so... One, he's still probably, I, okay, so I'm getting the vibe that he's probably still a good guy because she died unknowingly. Um, and because she died, 
when she was, she died randomly sleeping. Probably from a health issue no one, neither of them knew about. He recorded thought she was sleeping in. Okay, that I can, that I can accept. Okay, I'm fine with that. Why he kept the video? He wanted to remember her by... Does it seem like she's appeared on videos before? I would not have kept this up. That video up. That's my thing. Um, I guess I'm not him though, so maybe he, I guess to him it's a good way to remember him by, but yeah, I doubt, I wouldn't have done that. But you know, I guess I'm not one to say what the, what he should do with his YouTube channel. Uh, if he thinks he's a good way to remember, then he can keep the video up, it is his choice. Um... But yeah, that's a sucky thing to record without knowing it. Tim seems to be doing okay for himself now. Back at it with his vlogs, food reviews, and sports recaps. Occasionally, he'll upload tribute videos about his beloved Penny, and these are usually met with overwhelming support. She's still sleeping, to me, is insanely jarring. What appears to be a normal, everyday vlog about his loved one sleeping was, in actuality, not at all what it seemed. I, yeah, but I at least am glad with the fact that he did nothing to her. Because that, that's what my, I thought was happening there, so yeah. Also, rest in peace, Penny. The house part. We all love a good night out especially in college. In September of 2019, at the University of Ohio, students were throwing a pretty large Project X style house party. Everything seemed to be going just fine until one man decided that he'd raise his glass for a toast in one of the most extreme ways possible. Tyler Uhr, someone who the university claims is not a student there, decided to climb a utility pole of all- Hold on. Hold on, so this guy, who's not a college person, shows up at a college people's party, starts partying, and climbs a light- oh. Give me, just, get, just give me a minute, hold on. Took me about five seconds. I know, I know, but it got, what? I gotta see this. I have to see this. I'm sorry. I have to see this. All things to perform this stunt, as you might expect, this didn't turn out well for him. But even worse, this was all captured by multiple people on Snapchat. The following footage is what they witnessed. Show me this. Oh, 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 you see, you see, this is why you don't do stupid shit. What were you thinking, you mindless baboon? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You see the way he talked? Oh, my, I have to, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, this is like, what? So, first you see that flash, which who knows what happened to cause that. Something cause that flash and then you just see boom lose his grip there and tumbles to the front oh my I 
I'm. This is a very stupid decision he made. It is a very stupid choice. There was no. I'm trying not to swear right now. There is no damn intelligence in what he is saying, doing right now. Shame on this poor dude. Shame on this. Shame on this dude for dude's thing. However. I do hope he did not die from this, because that looks like something that could actually kill a person, so... I do hope he's alright. But that was stupid. A stupid idea, is what I mean. Oh! oh! So he raised, like he moved, and I think he hit the pole. I think he- hold on. I'm sorry. That's what, yeah, he did. So his arm hit the pole, hit the one of the poles, and a spark came from out of it. That's what happened. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I do hope he's right from the fall. But that was a dumb move to begin with, I don't know what the hell he was thinking. As we could see, after being electrocuted, he goes limp before falling an entire 30 feet to the ground. Very fortunately for him, he survived. But that's not to say that everyone initially thought he was dead. <laughs> On social- I think he- I'm sorry, I think he would be. I- I would believe that. Social media, these videos blew up. Because of this, people honed in on Barstool Sports, a Twitter account that's notorious for tweeting out stunts pulled by college students. At the time though, many, including them, didn't believe the fact that he survived. And so they put out the following message. Please stop messaging us the video of the guy getting electrocuted on Palmer tonight. We're not posting it. In the first response to this though, we're able to see the gruesome aftermath of what happened. A Twitter user named Zushin tweeted the following. Well, here's the aftermath. He's okay. With this video. Whew. Look at that there. That's from the landing. Tyler later claimed on Twitter, I broke three bones in my left leg and one broke through my skin. I have a slight fracture in my right hand and four minor breaks in my back. I also got a lot of burns from this and will be out of work for at least eight weeks or more, so anything helps. God bless. This was accompanied by a GoFundMe to assist with his medical bills, but unfortunately for him, this was met with a negative response. All in all, he seems to- I mean, okay, so... Yeah. That would happen. Because let, let's put it this way. You are asking people to support you. To recover from injuries. You cause for doing a stupid thing. You did the stupid thing. You climbed up a freaking telephone. A freaking pole. Elect one of those pole, electric pole things. You caused this problem. So yeah, people are not gonna have sympathy and want to help you. This you 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 did it to yourself. To be recovering, what many thought was going to be a simple night out at a house party, in reality, quickly turned dour. Tyler Ewer's stunt was an incredibly dumb move, leaving partygoers stunned at the possibility that they'd single-handedly witnessed a fatal freak accident. Luckily, that wasn't the case. But this situation serves as a lesson, hopefully repelling others that would have any shred of a desire to attempt anything remotely similar to this in the future. This says this one's the station. I don't know why I had to pause to tell you that, because it says it right there, but I just felt the need to. I've 
I've wanted to talk about this from the day I've started this series. To cap off this episode, I wanted to discuss what I personally believe to be, by far, one of the most disturbing pieces of media that presently exists on the internet. On the night of February 20th, 2003, a band by the name of Great Whites was headlining a show at a West Warwick, Rhode Island venue by the name of the station. The footage you're watching... Okay, so we, okay, so it's not what I thought it was because I thought it was going to be something like a train station or bus station disturbing footage. No, this is from a music venue or a bar or some type of venue where a band was performing. Watching was captured by a journalist named Brian Butler from the town's local news station, WPRI. In attendance, to shoot a video about nightclub safety, he began documenting the band's opening song. <laughs> oh, God. This guy, this man came there to show a thing on nightclub safety. And if there's one of the disturbing videos from around the internet, my guess is he was not safe. <laughs> oh, bad day to choose, my friend. Desert Moon. Everyone seemed to be having a great time, with nothing seemed to have gone awry. But little did they know that this performance would rapidly devolve into the 10th deadliest nightclub fire in world history. What? So what happened? Just seconds into the song, the band's tour manager, Michael Bichelle, set off pyrotechnics that he claimed he was permitted to use by the nightclub's owner. What he or the audience didn't see coming was the fact that these would suddenly set fire to the studio foam that surrounded the backside of the stage. Everyone thought it was part of the show. Right there, look at that. Fire. Fire, fire, ooh. You see him, so he knows, he know. this guy must know, because this guy's screaming back, this guy's moving back, he's like, this is not part, I gotta get, this guy has his gut, either, he has a gut feeling that's not part of the show, or he knows that's not part of the show, so he's getting out of there. Bang guy. Wow. That's not good. Yeah, no fucking shit, Sherlock. What a dumb line that was. Once people began to realize that the fire wasn't intended, a manic rush to get out took place. In less than 60 seconds, the entire stage was ablaze. While there were four exits to the building, the vast majority of attendees stormed the front door that they entered through, resulting in a dog pile that severely slowed everyone's exit. Okay, one, you cannot be surprised by that because this is a scenario where they only know the one exit. Like, they, will, they won't know this one, they won't know this one, and they won't know this one. Well, they might know this one, I don't know about that one, they definitely don't know of this one. So I'm not going to bowl through the kitchen. However, I think another mistake here, because I'm guessing this is the stage area, this is where it took place in this area. I think the mistake was that there was nobody, there was no secu security or people probably in this nightclub to control the situation. And I know it would be hard to because there was a fire, but your, your focus should be everyone, uh, getting everyone out of there. Nothing else. So, if no one is, if you're not telling a certain group of people, hey, go to this door, and you're not telling a certain group of people, go to the back, go to this one. Even if you're telling people in the very back, hey, get into the kitchen one, go to the kitchen, and you lead them there so the kitchen people know, hey, they'll, like, they're getting out of a situation, let them go through. If you, shut up, phone. If you don't have this going on, you don't have the... It's just going to cause chaos, because everyone just sees the fire and are going to react. 
Because of this, everyone began to panic further, leading to a massive jam in the narrow hallway that surrounded that route. That will happen, yep. Brian, among a few others, ended up making it out safely. However, the remainder of the footage shows that the vast majority of concert goers weren't quite as lucky. In the latter half of the video, screams, mass panic, and smoke can be observed coming from the building that, after a matter of minutes, was completely ablaze. This is dang scary looking because you don't know how many people are trapped in there. I have a feeling he's going to tell us and then my heart will break. But even just looking at this video, there was so much unknown and so much knocking. You don't know what's going on. You get an uneasy feeling from it. What is this guy doing? See, people here are trying to help. They're trying to see if they can help any way they can. I don't know what these guys at the door are doing because they look like they're just causing more problems. I don't know what these are doing. These people look like they're trying to get help. I don't know what the people at this door are doing. That night, 100 people- Why do they look like people are just lying on the ground? Like, if there are people- Okay, so here's the way I feel of this. The people over here on the side should be on the aisle way, grabbing people and pulling them away to safety. That's to be the first thing they're doing. No, I don't care. Don't worry about the fire getting people out of the safe, because the more people get out of there, the better. What I think is happening is they're just yelling at each other. These guys are just yelling at these people instead of actually trying to get them to safety. And because these guys are lying here, people can't get out of the situation. So people are being trapped inside. So the lack of communication and the panic that everyone is doing right now is what's causing more problems. People not. And again, it's hard for me, easy for me. It, I mean, it's easy for me to say, oh, you should have done this ahead of time. Again, I'm not in this situation. So I can understand people are going to say, oh, you weren't there. You don't know what's going on. I understand that. I'm just going through what would go through my head if I was in this. I'd be start giving out orders. Probably no one's going to listen to me, but I'd start giving out orders to help the situation. Lost their lives, with 230 of them bearing non-fatal injuries. Among those that passed were the band's guitarist, Tyler Longley, and the show's MC, Michael Gunsolves, both of which were believed to have lost valuable escape time due to their attempts at salvaging their equipment. I'm sorry, they're idiots. They are idiots. I'm sorry, but they're idiots. I don't care your band. I don't care that how much music thing goes. You are in a fire. This is a life or death situation. Now, that's immediately what a fire is, if you don't put it out. A fire like that is a life or death situation. And you're telling me, their more focus was not survival, but saving equipment. Idiots. In a first-hand account by Brian Butler, the one that captured the footage, they claimed the following. It was that fast. As soon as the pyrotechnics stopped, the flame had started on the egg crate backing behind the stage, and it just went up the ceiling, and people stood and watched it, and some people backed off. When I turned around, people were already trying to leave, and others were just sitting there going, Yeah, that's great! And I remember that statement, because I was like, This is not great. This is time to leave. At first, there was no panic. Everyone just kind of turned. Most people still just stood there. 
In the other rooms, the smoke hadn't gotten to them. The flame wasn't that bad, and they didn't think anything of it. Well, I guess once we all started to turn towards the door, and we got bottlenecked into the front door, people just kept pushing, and eventually everyone popped out of the door, including myself. That's when I turned back. I went around back. There was no one coming out of the back door anymore. I kicked out a side window to try to get people out of there. One guy did crawl out. I went back around the front again, and that's when you saw people stacked on top of each other, trying to get out the front door. And by then, the black smoke was pouring out over their heads. I noticed when the pyro stopped, the flame had kept going on both sides, and then on one side, I noticed it come over the top, and then- Man, that is, that is a big fire. That is a big fire right there, Whew. That's when I said, I have to leave. And I turned around, I said, get out, get out, get to the door, get to the door. And people just stood there. There was a table in the way at the door and I pulled that out just to get it out of the way so people could get out easier. And I never expected it to take off as fast as it did. It just, it was so fast. It had to be two minutes tops before the whole place was black smoke. According to reports, there were 462 people in attendance that night, whereas the venue's official capacity was 404. Survivors of the blaze claimed that while there were multiple exits, bouncers were restricting people from escaping via the back door. This restriction was in place up until the moment that the bouncers realized the reality of the situation, at which point... And now we know the problem. That's it. That became the problem. Those bouncers were so strict, even with a fire there, that you have to go out the front door, that everyone immediately had to rush to it. If the bouncers had allowed people to go out that door, that fire would be fine. They, I mean, it would have been fine for the fact that people more, pe more people would have gone out of that area, at that situation, had those bouncers not played that stupid rule and not it's not even like play stupid rule in general when you see a fire you let that rule go by if someone says there's a fire you need to let us out let them out points they fled according to further reports the station's owners Michael and Jeffrey Durdarian both didn't have workers' comp insurance for their employees, nor did they have any sort of fire safety system in place, both becoming vital details in their legal cases. Idiots. Just proving how stupid most people are. Um, these two are freaking idiots. Are just absolute idiots. They are sitting there, they don't have workers' compensation for their employees, they don't have a fire plan. Who doesn't have a fire plan? Mort. Go. After this all took place, blame shifted through multiple parties. The band claimed that they had permission to use pyrotechnics for their show. The Dardarian brothers claimed otherwise. Furthermore, the I don't believe those other I don't believe those brothers. Distributors of the studio foam and JBL, the producer of the venue speakers, were blamed for the flammable material in their products. However, both denied any wrongdoing. In regards to official charges and sentencing, the band's tour manager in 2006 pleaded guilty to 100 counts of involuntary manslaughter, resulting in 15 years in prison with four to serve and 11 years suspended, topped off with three years of probation. In 2007, with good behavior, he'd become eligible for parole as the judge saw him unlikely to reoffend. As of 2008, it was granted. As for Michael Derderian, he received the same punishments, but in 2009 was released from prison due to good behavior. So both people are currently out, okay? know how stupid that is but let's face fact of the brothers should be for the fact 
that they, in my mind, caused this more than anybody else. They caused it by not having a fire player. They caused it by making the rule for the bouncers that they cannot let anyone out those two back done. You can only enter the front, enter and exit the front door. That's a bad rule. The fact that I believe, just my gut, that they allowed that peep, that band do pyro without thinking twice. That's another one that makes me think. So right now, I feel that those two brothers caused it. Jeffrey, on the other hand, received a 10-year suspended sentence with three years of probation and 500 hours of community service, but avoided all prison time due to a no-contest plea. Within a myriad of in and out of court settlements to victims and their families, as of September of 2008, over $115 million had been paid out in total due to the calamity that occurred on that late February evening. It should be more. It should be more. I wonder what... There should be way more. The station nightclub fire, in its entirety, is a situation that never should have happened. Agreed. From the pyrotechnics, to the lack of a fire safety system, to the bouncers forbidding people from exiting, the entire incident is something that will forever go down as one of the worst tragedies in recent history. 100 lives were lost. Lives that were in attendance to... A hundred people out of the 400 died from this. All because of stupid choices by stupid people. I feel bad for all those 100 people and their families. My, I have condolences. Because they did nothing wrong. They can't enjoy a band. It was stupid choices by stupid people that caused them to end their lives. And I have all the sympathy in the world for all of them. Simply ha All the victims. The stupid people can go F off. They're stupid. Oh, dumb people who should not be running a business. Have a good time and enjoy a rock band. Lives that did not deserve, by any stretch, to have their existence brutally taken from them. I agree, they did not deserve that at all. Tonight, we've explored some of the most disturbing bits of media that are out there. Like I said, if you do a bit of digging, you'll find that the world can be dark disturbing, and incredibly depressing. Thanks to all of you for joining me in this 10th installment of Disturbing Things from Around the Internet. No, thank you. Thank you, my good friend, Nexpo, for giving us this series to record and react to, and it is amazing stuff. Thank you all for joining me on this reaction video. If you would like to watch this original video, it will be in the link below. Thank you all for watching. Hope you really enjoyed it. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. Comment anything you'd like to comment about these videos that you've seen. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. And I will uh, see you guys on the next one.